Willkommen äh, zu der Veranstaltung. To the panel discussion. It's only a children's book. The complexity of the supposed simple. Even if you don't, if I don't see you, honorable audience, I'm happy that you are here. Thank you very much for your interest in this panel discussion. Our subject today is children's books and the challenges for the production of books. In the past few years, the awareness for the significance of uh, supporting young children and adolescents in reading, there has been more and more interest. And there are clear yardstick that have been defined to achieve that with promotion programs and with awards. People who work in culture and literature are appreciated more and more and get more and more support. But, and that's the big but, now as before, the idea is that children's books are not that demanding and top quality as books for adults. You see that with many things, among others with the fees, the money that can be earned with um, writing children's books. And also in the book market, they are not taken seriously. They are not appreciated. Um, people ridicule you or they overlook you. The question that we look into is whether the presentation of children's books is so easy, really, and what's the challenge for you, for you who produce books? So these are the questions that I would like to look at today with my panel guests. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. I welcome the three guests that are here with me. They don't sit here together coincidentally, but they have come together because of a certain subject. And this subject is a children's book, The Lilic Girl, of Atale Lakia. In 2019, it was produced under the Tamad publisher in Palestine. In 2020, it uh, received the uh, Sheikh Zayed Prize of the section of children's books. And 2021, in the German translation, it was published with the Sujet Publishing House. I welcome Ibtisan Barakat from the United States, online connected with us. She is the author of the book, Suleiman Tafik, on the right-hand side here. He translated the book from Arabic into German, and Majid Mohit from Bremen published the book in German and published it on the German book market. Ibtisan Barakat, you were born in Jerusalem, and since the end of the 80s, you have lived in the United States. You are a lyricist, a prose author, write essays, write children's books. You are an artist, you are an educator, you are a, a teacher of writing. You have been recognized a lot for your work. You have received several awards, and one was the uh, best known Arabic book prize, the Sajid Book Prize. Now, I ask you, how can you all do that? All these different activities, the day only has 24 hours. So maybe you need rather 60 hours for a day. Here at the Frankfurt Book Fair for bringing people together from all over the world. And I want to thank the Sheikh Zayed Book Awards uh, for recognizing my work and also um, building a culture of literature, a wonderful new culture of literature in the Arab world. And uh, I want to thank uh, the panel, all of you um, here, the translator, the publisher, moderator, and the interpreter. Ich höre ganz and um, now I can answer. Um, a writing, for me, it, it's an art, of course. Uh, a writing is the mother of all arts. And art is a self-expression. And expression literally comes from breathing. So the artist uh, breathes. Uh, their art. Uh, for me, I breathe in uh, words and poetry and um, um, literary expressions. And sometimes our breath is fast and sometimes our breath is uh, slow. Sometimes our breath is uh, that of um, a dance and sometimes our breath is that of sadness. And so it's different expressions. We breathe differently. 
and I allow myself to breathe differently. So I write all kinds of forms, not intentionally. It's just because this is what I discover inside of me. Okay, vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful answer. Sulaiman Tafik, you are born in Syria and you have lived in Germany since 1971. You are a person of many talents. You are a lyricist, prose writer, um, reviewer of music, translator of Arabic literature into German and German literature into Arabic. Your work has 36 books and some have been written by you, children's books, and also translations of children's books. And you have also received several awards already. What of these many activities are most important for you? What is um, the most important one? The children's books. I would say that's so important as I started to write when my children was, were very small. I wanted to tell stories to them and before they went to sleep I always told them stories and the next day um, they, they asked me to repeat that story and, and I had forgotten what I had told them. And then, then they said, no, 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 now you, you, you narrated it wrongly. And that's how I came across this idea to write children's books. But uh, writing children's books or translating them, that's different from um, books for adults. For children, imagination is so important. Imagination of the world, what they have in their mind, that's totally different from our world. And I had to be so careful that I understand their world when I give narrations or translate. And children's books are not read by the children, but rather by adults who read loud to children. That needs to be considered as well when translating or writing such books. Thank you. Majid Mohid, you come from Iran. Since the beginning of the 90s, you have um, been in Germany in 96. You founded the Sergé Publishing House. At the beginning, you rather published um, Excel literature. But now, 25 years later, you have a very broad and wide range of products, poetry, um, prose, Books have been translated from different languages than German, original German books, and very lately you also have children books in your program. Now you have moved away from exile literature and rather publish what you call Luftwurzliteratur, aerial root literature. You have coined that word and it, it has become known as a term. What is Luftwurzliteratur, aerial root literature? Luftwurzel Literatur, um, to translate that um, is a bit difficult. As you quite rightly said, exile literature was the beginning. That's how I started as a publisher. And then life developed, and my concept also de developed further. Exile developed a different significance for me, different meaning, and I thought, the demand is there to find a different term, a different notion. Sometimes it's confused. When you talk about exile, um, people confuse it with the cliches that you had from the past, um, post-war literature, etc. At the moment, this uh, Luftwurzliteratur, um, or the follow-up of exile literature, is literature that has to do with authors that um, now live somewhere else and got along with a new language, a new home, are multilingual now, and, and therefore it's a different type of literature. And I looked for a term, and, and I call it aerial root literature, but okay, you should say right from the beginning, Luftwurzelliteratur, cannot just um, be connected with air only. It's roots that are there, roots in the ground, and additional um, aerial roots 
that help you to get uh, a better nutrition. That means better understanding, so that you you get your food um, from the ground and from the air. Okay, that's how it's meant. All the three of, of you deal with children's book. Isiban Barakat, may I ask you, you want to also support his geography. That's what you said, writing stories that allow all different voices to tell the story. And how can you link that with writing for children? Thank you for the wonderful question. Uh, but first, I want to say that my name is Ibti Sam. Uh, it's, it means a smile in Arabic. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult for people to say it. It's just a musical phrase, Ibti Sam. Um, regarding the question, I do not separate childhood uh, from adulthood. For humanity, there's a lifespan. It starts in childhood, ich höre and what happens in childhood informs every single day of our life. Mm -hmm. okay. The majority of adults in the world, they look back at childhood to be inspired, because the roots of joy, really, and the roots of sadness, and the roots of the questions that we carry with us throughout our lives happen in childhood. Each person's story unfolds with the events of childhood. For instance, for me, there was war at age three. There was loving the letter Aleph, um, the first letter in the Arabic language. There was loving nature in every way, and nature became my family as well. Uh, so I do not separate writing for children from writing for any other audience, because I see humanity as a continuum. However, in every stage of life, there is um, a different language. That language is based on our experiences of that life stage and what happens in it. So what happens in later on in life, the child doesn't know. And what happens in childhood, most of the times the grown-ups forget or aim to forget, or the society forces people to forget, to allow that um, to just be childhood, like a completely different country, and you, you immigrate out of uh, childhood. Uh, so writing for children, I love what Suleiman said about understanding the audience when you write uh, for children, because indeed every audience has characteristics. And in childhood, this is a world that is a genius world, children, full of innocence, full of questions, real questions. The questions that the ph philosophers ask, and they are rewarded like, oh my gosh, they ask this question about life, children ask. But when children ask that, they are like seen as childish. And when a grown up person asks the same question a child has asked a long time ago, they are awarded the Nobel Prize or something like that. Because there's a disconnection. There's a disconnection in the uh, human process. And for me, I aim to uh, facilitate for each person I come in contact with through my writing or through actual workshops or in any interaction, even now, you know, the audience now, I want to invite the audience to think of their story, their entire life story as their own personal property because you own it but not only your personal property. Your life story is the property of humanity. And I have a vision, like a dream, that someday the society will encourage every human being, even pay them like at a certain point in life or at any point in life, to write their life story and to be free of any legal problems, like if they committed some you know, theft or a crime or something, to be free of any punishment in order to write the honest story of a human being. And maybe for that, you know, to be hidden for a hundred years and later on to be given to humanity. So we will know what our story as humans is. Right now, we only know a little bit because people are punished for being honest. And that honesty starts in childhood. And if we just help the child to become, to continue to be honest and tell their story, 
we would have a, a society that's thousands of years of intelligence ahead from now. So I try to plant this seed of allowing the human to be who they are with their struggle, with their problems, with their imperfections, um, and tell us that. So we will have a real picture of who we are. Thank you. Thank you. Suleiman Tofik. you said already why you started to write children's books. It was rather your personal motivation with your own children. I would like to add the next question now. When you translate children's books, how do you deal with the different narration strategies that exist in Arabic uh, and in German? Maybe there are different strategies and structures. How do you solve that problem when translating? When translating, I translate the books not word by word, but I rather try um, to give the story that is in Arabic also in German. That's my technique. I don't translate word by word. I just tell the story as if I had written it in a different language. And don't forget, you have to be careful. Children are these little philosophers. They ask all these essential questions. And sometimes the essential questions, um, you might think they're too difficult for children. But I've made the experience. It's not difficult for them. They ask this question every day. They ask, Daddy, why is that so? So they permanently ask these essential questions. And it's so important for me that these essential questions are there also when they are translated, are still there. And I think that the children in the world are very similar. There are not that many differences. When I'm in Syria and I sit together with my nephews, they are just like my kids, no difference. So it's important for us that we tell the story in German then when it was originally Arabic. So a new story, not a translation, but rather uh, telling a new story in the different language. And also considering um, the linguistic structure, there are some sentences that I can't translate word by word. No one would understand that here. Or certain events in Syria or Palestine, that they, they, um, they, they are um, different. Um, you know, the, 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 the Lilic girl um, is, is a good example of that. We, we'll talk about that later. Thank you, uh, Mr. Majid Mohid. Now, you have just recently taken up children's books in your program for the publishing house. Why did you do that? Well, we, we had children's books before, uh, at the very beginning when we started. We had uh, five children's books in the first two to three years of our activities, among um, them a translation from French into German. However, at that time, I noticed it's a bit difficult. The market was not our market. We were at the beginning um, of our publishing work, and it was really difficult in peril. Um, to do that, our concept that we wanted to do, to in addition to that, in parallel to that, also publish children's books. But it has always been a wish of mine, and um, I still want to do it because I believe children's books have um, this big potential. They have so high potential, and also this important literary contact that um, help people to start a dialogue. And we tried to do that right from the beginning, to have this dialogue, to have this exchange between um, the authors and the audience. That has always been a wish of mine. And the two books then that um, we published were, of course, well, let me put it that way. It was so interesting that there was a pre-selection. The authors had already received well-renowned awards before, so right from the beginning you could see that it could be successful. 
and um, Suleiman also um, was influential in that. So you could um, know immediately that these were beautiful books, especially. Uh, and I'm so happy. I'm, I'm really so happy that we uh, talk about this book and that we have the little girl in our program. So. It's not only the book, but um, Ibtisam is such a great personality. I've listened to many presentations and panel discussions with her. She's such a great person. And as I said, children's books are, are part of our production and important for us, as it allows dialogue and exchange. And that's really important, and that's part of our concept. I conclude with that, that children's books are part of the so-called Luftwurzel-Literatur, aerial root literature. Yeah, children aerial root literature. So I, I, I wouldn't mark it that way. Uh, I, I, it's, it's a type of literature that is multilingual and multicultural. You briefly mentioned that it was relatively difficult at the beginning with children's books. What were the difficulties or what was the challenge? The market of children's books is really big. I mean, big and powerful publishing houses are active in that. And we were such a small publisher. Um, and to produce children's books and market them, that's really difficult. Here, or at that time, we were really careful that the subjects fitted into our concept to a certain extent. So at the beginning, um, we, we really wanted to bring about our concept. We didn't have aerial root literature. We had exile literature. And children's books came slowly in that segment. And um, at that time, the problem um, was really big for us. But now, as we have grown and followed up on new subjects, and the little girl really fits so well into our program, and we can support it, um, of course, with the support of uh, Sheikh Said. That's an important institution. It's important to have cultural exchange. We all know that it needs to be supported. This type of culture. Um, needs more power when you want to sell it and market it. You need more efforts in organization, and you need support for that. So such children's books, to publish them without the support, without um, supporting funds, it would not be possible? Is, is that what you said? No, it's not impossible. It's always possible to produce or uh, publish a book. But um, I ask myself as a publisher, is that enough for me to, to produce it? Um, a book um, starts to live once it's on the market. And then your work starts before as well. You have to prepare it. But after it's on the market, your work starts. You have to make it better known. Not only earn money with that, but also make it better known. And for that, you need support. I mean, it's not easy to organize readings or events and, and have professional people to do that. It's uh, really a lot of press work, etc. For that, you need support. And that's otherwise not possible. Oh, super. Thank you. Times are over in which children's literature was just um, easygoing stories and a beautiful world only was depicted. This is no longer the case. Nowadays, children's literature more and more deals with the real world, also with sad realities and the problems of that world. And this is also true for the little girl. It's a complex subject that it deals with. It's a collective traumatic experience with historic dimension. And it um, determines the reality of the people today. The Palestine disaster, 1948, the displacement of um, Palestine people. And it has continued till today. Ibtisam um, Barakat. You successfully talked about that great and very complex subject. And in a presumably easy language, you process it for children. How did you do that? What techniques did you use to do that? 
Um, thank you for the question. This is one of the biggest questions of my life, is like, how did you do that? Actually, um, it, it is not a technique. It's a way of being. Uh, every, uh, every book that I've written has uh, addressed a big question of the questions of my life as a Palestinian, as a woman, as an Arab, as a person grew up in a Muslim culture and now lives in, in the West, as a person in the world, on the global scene. And so each, I negotiate, like my laboratory is my writing, I negotiate these big questions. Uh, many of them are big wounds that need healing in my writing. All my life, absolutely every day of my life, I have been working on, in my uh, unconscious, on the 1948 uh, displacement or genocide. Uh, for us, it's a genocide. Um, and how to help myself, because my mom was displaced in 1948, and I was displaced as a child in 1967, and my uh, family members displaced in other wars. So we have this wound, layers of wounds. So as a human being and as a writer, I have a deep um, need. It's not just artistic. Uh, the art is my medicine, but the need is beyond the art. The need is for all the people who are artists or not artists. We need to transcend this wound, to create healing in it. Uh, for instance, the Jews uh, are working on healing the genocide for themselves as they need to in order to heal. We, the Palestinians, have to work on healing the, the Nakba and all the other wars and the occupation and colonialism, all of it. Now, the writer is in a place to address this in a symbolic way. And I, because I've worked on it all my life, when the opportunity came to me, they invited me to uh, participate in this uh, project, uh, writing about artists, I found a window in which I could create healing for myself and for all the children and the grown-ups and all the Palestinians from now on for the rest of time to read a story in which we reach the wound and we don't fall in it and get stuck one more time. After 70 years, we continue to be stuck. I wanted the child to hear about the Nakba and transcend it like a car driving. You reach that ditch and you keep driving, you pass it and move forward. And I've, in my unconscious, this has gotten resolved through color, art, and um, the going home. And then not only the, the girl loves home, but her home loves her. She loves the colors. The colors also love her. They come with her. Also, without really meaning it, this story has many layers. And one of the most important layers for me, which you may get or not get in the story is that the wound of the Palestinians or the story of the Palestinians is part of the story of the Jews. It is a continuation of the Holocaust. It's just another chapter of it in a different land with a different people, with different players. So it happened in Europe and then the wound happened in Europe or probably before that because humanity has been wounding one another for a long time. But about the lilac girl, so it happened in uh, Europe, and then the European Jews and other Jews went to Palestine and did the same thing to the Palestinians. So we got wounded in the same way they got wounded. So the Holocaust didn't end, and that's the truth. If you go to Palestine, you will see that. And in the lilac girl, the Jewish girl who is wounded, she lost her home in Europe, she lost her home in the Roman Empire, she lost her home in many places. She took the home of the Palestinian girl. So the Jewish girl is wounded and trying to heal, but it's not the right way of healing to take someone else's home. And the Palestinian girl is trying to heal, so she's going to her home. And she has the conflict of, do you displace someone else? These are real questions for nations, not only for children or for me as a writer. But the most important part, regardless of who lives in the home and who leaves the home, is that healing happens for the human heart and for the human being. And the Lila girl, my Palestinian little uh, girl, heals through her art. And I hope for healing for the Jewish girl as well, to see that, wow, that girl also belongs in this home. Perhaps we can give her a room, um, but in all cases, 
I gave her a whole story to live in and a question for all people to look at in terms of healing. We really need to have home in ourselves. And art gives people a home. In the Lilik girl, the words are used like Nakba, the Palestinian uh, disaster, 1948, and Naksa, defeat after the Six Days War, 1960. And with the Palestine subject, the Arabic audience, at least um, the adults, uh, really know what it's all about, depending on age and origin. They all know about the subject. But the German audience, the German-speaking audience, maybe doesn't know about these terms. How did you solve that problem in translation? Nakba cannot be translated um, word by word. Children don't know about it. Uh, these are events that cannot be explained. But children can also understand it because many children lose their homes. The house, the home is a symbol for feeling at home. Like this year in Germany, there was a big disaster. There was a flooding and many houses were destroyed. So also children who live there in the flooded areas don't have their houses any longer, which is a sad story. Or the children from Syria, refugees who also lost their houses and they can't go home any longer and they are longing for their home. In Aachen, I had a project with refugee children from Afghanistan Afghanistan, from Syria, from the Iraq, and there was asked to paint something. It was an art project. And honestly, nearly 80% of them drew houses. And then I thought, how important is the house for these kids? Not the building, but having a home, their house. And in, in Germany, they now live. That's not their house. At least that's how they see it. They always wrote my house. Uh, and that was not in Germany. So that's an important uh, question that the little girl deals with. It's universal. It's a universal story. OK, it takes place in Palestine. But um, it's not only a Palestine story, but it's a universal story. And that's what I thought also when I translated the book. Thank you. Mr. Mohit, what about the interest of the audience in such serious subjects? Children, parents, educators, um, do they like to offer such difficult matters to children or would they rather prefer humorous pictures, uh, humorous books? Okay, humorous books, that's easier. Um, normally, they, they don't really want to uh, have um, many sad stories. But as we are talking now about children's books or satires, I mean, uh, Suleiman Taufik had some very humorous books also that were published by us. You can present situations that are said in a way that children can cope with. That's good literature, high quality literature, as um, Lily Girl shows. And, and that was done so well because of this um, very sad and highly emotional subject that is dealt with. And at the same time, there is so much light, so much hope. and. That's really good to, to offer this as well at the same time. And this is really what we must try. It's a bit difficult, but I believe as we are talking about children's books, it's not wrong to deal with difficult matters that normally would rather be meant for adults because young children learn to perceive things differently. Not only adults, but also children shall learn about it, as the two colleagues have described it. This is our task as writers and publishers. We want to do that with our events, with our panel discussions, with our press work. Thank you. I have now questions about the target group, the target um, audience, Ibtisam. What target audience did you have in mind when you wrote the book? Was it rather Palestine children with the same experience or children in general? 
Uh, the target uh, audience was me. Uh, I have a Palestinian girl inside of me who was displaced uh, by the war. And this girl needs to heal and needs to hear many stories. Actually, she's behind all of my creativity. <laughs> and um, I adopted her. I tell audiences wherever I go, I, I have an adopted girl who lives inside of me. And so she's my first audience for all of my writings. And it's not intentional, it's just an organic relationship. Uh, the second uh, audience, is, which is my great uh, interest and passion, is uh, the um, Palestinian Arab uh, Middle Eastern displaced child, the child who lived in a tsunami in Japan, the Afghanistani child, the Syrian child, the Jewish child, any child who has lost uh, something and by losing their, not just home, their families, their goats, their pets, they lost their link with humanity. The issue isn't about a home, stones. It's about losing the link with humanity, feeling alone in the world, feeling displaced, feeling unsafe with other human beings. This is novel for the species, our species, to feel unsafe with other human beings because of the behavior of adults. I just want to uh, respond a little bit to what uh, Mr. Majid uh, said. And I, before I forget, I love that expression about roots below and roots above and roots everywhere. It's just like the sun, light going, creating roots everywhere. Please write that down and send it to me, sign, <laughs> sign it for me. Um, uh, but with the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the children and, and the audience, who we address this to. I address this to every child who feels disconnected from humanity because of the behaviors of adults. And as Mr. Majid said, like, oh, we, it's good for us to address maybe a little bit of difficult uh, topics in children's literature. I want to remind everyone who's listening always that children in the world whether they read about the topics, the hard topics in books or not, they live these topics. They live the wars, they live the displacements, they live the divorces, they live the questions, they live the bullying. And whether we write about it or not, they live it and it's inside their hearts and minds and these questions are haunting them, keeping them up at night, those children. And it's good for us to rise to the occasion and write about what they struggle with. It's not luxury. In ways that give them hope and allows us to, you know, um, to feel that we're doing the right thing rather than re-traumatizing them. But addressing these issues in books and in arts and creative hopeful ways is essential. Thank you. Thank you. Herr Mohit, um, das Lied well, the little girl um, is bilingual um, in your publishing house, Arabic in German. And um, who is the target audience for the bilingual books? And why do you follow this concept of bilingual books? This belongs to our concept, multilingual books, and of course, you can't uh, do that with very long texts, but we have different solutions for that. But with shorter texts, children's books and uh, poetry, we also do it in two languages. The target audience, all children, parents, adults, and people, not only um, having fun uh, to do that, but have this awareness of being multilingual and regarding this multilingual book as a way of communication so that then they can reflect on it together. So in the future, uh, maybe they can deal with each other in a more peaceful world. They, they can maybe uh, get to know each other better. And I believe the optical point having bilingual books offer this possibility. So you see the other culture, the other language immediately. You perceive it immediately. And I think that's really the right way. 
Mr. Taufik in the Arabic world, and here you are at home, and you have followed the book market in the two regions. Lately, the book market for children's literature has changed a lot. What can you tell us about the Arabic world? Have there been other developments or trends lately with respect to the production of children's books? Unfortunately, in earlier time, there were hardly any children's books. When I was a child in Syria, we didn't have children's books. If so, it was fairy tales, horrible um, fairy tales, and, and they, they uh, didn't give you the chance to filter that. And later on, the nationalists came in power, and then they started to produce children's books that were rather ideological or nationalist. I love your home country, etc. That was the big headline of fighting against colonialism. These children's books were not read by anyone because children's book children don't want to read such books. Their world, their reality is totally different. Later on, maybe because of the uh, Sheikh Said Prize um, and their support. Other books entered the Syrian market. These books are not known here in Germany. Maybe we, we have to create more awareness. And the books from the Arabic world that now could come here to the Western world offer new ideas to the world of the children. Children might think different. And they see that children in the Arabic world uh, might think differently, and the world is different there. And so it's so important that children already at that age learn about the world of others. That's a, such a good initiative, and I think we can, can have more of them. We have talked about the third, we haven't talked about the third language in that book. That's illustrations of Sinan Halab. Ipisam. In your book, the text and the illustrations, how are they linked? In the production of in the production of the story, uh, the story came first, the text came first, and then it was sent by the Tamar Institute. Well, they chose uh, an illustrator and they chose uh, Sinan Halak, he's um, an illustrator or an artist from Lebanon, and to illustrate the book. He chose to um, to study, I think, the works of Tamam um, al-Akhal, the artist I write about, and to possibly pull out some of the elements uh, from her work into the illustration. The, the illustrations and the book work together in a, a beautiful way. I think he did a great job uh, in being spare, which means like keeping it elegant on the elegant side, not like making it too much because the topic itself is very deep and is very um, big. So to keep the expression, just the language, very elegant and the illustration very elegant, even the production, you know, uh, the, um, the image, the cover image, they did a great job in, in just using an image that is very uh, stark and beautiful and alone. It, it's a very evocative this way. Now, so the book worked in a beautiful way this way. However, personally, as a, as a human being who thinks about these things, I believe that the child grows better if we give her or him a book without illustrations or a story without illustration. And I would like to respond to um, uh, Suleiman, uh, uh, the beautiful um, translator and thinker and writer. In the Arabic culture, uh, children's literature is not new, but our culture is oral. And so uh, 1001 Nights and Alf Leila Wulayla and all these Sindibad and uh, Aladdin, they come from the Arab uh, world uh, where orally, the stories were told orally. And there was no uh, separation between a child and an adult. The stories were told to everyone and the child understood in a certain way, the adult understood in a different way. The child understood the same story in a way when she was young and she understood the same story differently as she grew. So the story was a tool throughout her life to show her one thing that is extremely important. 
that as we grow and change experiences, the same thing changes. Our understanding of the same thing changes, and it must change so we wouldn't be rigid. Now, that's a very important thing, that a story remains with you all your life, as opposed to just in, you read it in childhood, and then when you grow up, you read something else. But you need genius stories, such as Aladdin and all the other stories uh, that can meet the need of children, the imagination, the great adventure, and can meet the need of the in-between and can meet the need of the grown-up. So it meets the need of humanity, and these are stories that live uh, forever, of course. Ich habe noch sehr, sehr viele Fragen. I would have many more questions, but unfortunately we have to come to an end as we have limited time only. But let me ask you uh, once again, the illustrations, did they influence you when translating the text or did you just translate the text independent of the picture? No, I can't do that. I mean, the illustrations helped me to understand um, certain things and to have a good grip and grasp of the text. And the illustrations were wonderful. I liked them a lot. And in the layout, um, the, the letters were also in different colors, where, where the, the colors are painted by the girl. And that was also then reflected in the text. You, as publisher, were also inspired. By, by it, yes, yes, of course, it's great, yeah, to to really do that that way. It was really successfully done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that really belongs to my concept. I would like to express another wish at the end. Do you have another wish as an author, as a publisher, or anything you want to say now? Let me start. I would like to get the possibility and maybe get help for that, that not only these books are produced, but that we can go to kindergartens and, and read it out to them. I mean, something like that needs to be organized, projects like that. I would love that. I, I can only support that. That's my wish also. I, I would like to express that these great books that are produced uh, can be then be brought um, to um, other interested people and, and really go to schools or kindergartens. Ibtisam, do you have a wish? A last wish. <laughs> I wish that all wars in the world end uh, so I can write stories that don't have wars uh, between people, but possibly wars between colors and we produce different uh, dimensions. Uh, but I. Uh, now, just to be specific about this book, I would love to uh, read uh, The Lilac Girl in Arabic and have Suleiman read it in German, like line by line. I would say the Arabic, he would say the, the German, and we would do a, a fun presentation in both languages to help um, launch the book to uh, a, a global audience, not just the um, in Germany or in the Arab world, or now it's actually it's been translated into Greek as well. Uh, so, just really to help the story reach the hands of uh, uh, readers, young and and all ages, because that's where a book belongs in the hands of readers, and then in their minds and in their hearts to help them. Ich bedanke mich herzlich für diese spannende Diskussion. Uh, Thank you very much for the extremely interesting. Um, discussion, Ibtisam, Majid and Suleiman. And not forget the two invisible people who helped me um, to keep going, Heike Kirchner, the interpreter, and Günther Ort. Thank you very much to the two of you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.